they discovered skeletal remains, and they were able to positively identify Suzanne through her dental records and her cancer port. I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Almost two years ago, in September 2021, Barry's elite defense attorney appeared before a Sheffield County judge and suggested Suzanne wasn't dead, but instead ran away to await her lover in Ecuador. Well, the fact that Suzanne's remains were found near Moffat, not 3,350 miles away, But less than 50, well, that has drawn a line through that nonsense. In this analysis, we're going to look at five insights that change the game in terms of the Morphew case. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, If you're enjoying this analysis, if you find it, um, you know, astute, intelligent, worthwhile, you can like, share, leave a comment. Uh, You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. Number one, the police narrative was more reliable. So I think in hindsight, we can say that the, the narrative from law enforcement overall was more reliable, meaning that um, Suzanne was murdered. Suzanne wasn't still alive, right? The fact that Suzanne's death is not only official, but accepted as fact on both sides changes the game significantly. The discovery of Suzanne's remains, apparently completely by chance, serves to reinforce the original police theory that something serious had happened to Suzanne and that she had likely been murdered. This is clearly much closer to the truth than varying suggestions made by the defense. Number two, even the defense believed she was murdered. Very shortly after it was confirmed that Suzanne's remains were positively identified, Barry's lawyer suggested what happened to her may have been the work of a serial killer in the area. In other words, the defense have now shifted their position again with the crucial difference that they now agree with law enforcement that this should be a murder investigation. They just disagree on who is the most suspicious person. But look at how much time has been wasted Rather than, having, rather than showing much interest in pursuing a perpetrator in the Morphew case, the defense seemingly chose to believe Suzanne was still alive, and instead they've tried to sue the authorities. One wonders how that jibes with the acknowledgement that Suzanne was murdered and law enforcement are needed now to bring the perpetrator to justice. So suing the investigators now kind of seems to be in exceedingly bad taste if you think about it. I mean, don't you want to help them find who did something terrible to this person that you love? And of course, it conveniently undermines the very authorities as it pertains to one lawyer's client. Anyway, number three, is Barry's behavior suspicious? Well, we know that Barry had strange injuries that seemed to be in various states of healing, He had cuts and abrasions that were just starting to scab over, and some thought that it looked like a fingernail injury on his left arm below the shoulder. So one can see how Barry's injuries close to the time that Suzanne disappeared didn't seem quite as significant in the absence of human remains as they do now. Now that Suzanne's remains are in the picture, the circumstances surrounding when she was last seen become, I think, a lot more loaded. Number four. Why did Barry delete a crucial text from Suzanne? And you might also say, is that suspicious? Is it suspicious deleting texts at the same time when someone disappears? When Barry was asked why he deleted the text that Suzanne sent him, trying to end their marriage just days before she went missing, he said that he didn't want their two daughters to see that text, and that's why he deleted it. Now, I'm not sure if that is referring to the I'm done text, but it certainly is referring to this one. Oh, I'm sure your mistress has 
you all happy now. So you can say you love me, but bully me when you're with me. Yeah, that's love. According to lawandcrime.com, Barry deleted numerous calls between himself and Suzanne from May 4th to 5th, 2020. And so that is obviously just four days, just a couple of, a handful of days before um, she disappeared. It's not just one or two calls, it's numerous calls. When asked by FBI agents in April 2021 why he deleted those calls, he said he didn't recall doing so and he must have been freeing up space on his phone. Months earlier, the husband's phone allegedly showed a number of sexually charged internet searches about a younger woman, a girl, and, well, I'm not going to go too much into that, but that is in the affidavit. Number five, why has Barry insisted that their marriage was perfect? And what's quite interesting is, on the one hand, Barry will say that they loved one another and they that everything was beautiful. But on the other hand, he will talk about uh, Suzanne uh, having trouble with alcoholism. Anyway, so this is also from lawandcrime.com. It's just quoting some aspects from the affidavit. Well, like I said, she never sat me down and said that to me, ever. She's made comments via text, but she's never sat me down and said, Barry, I want a divorce. Never. Over the course of around a dozen conversations with law enforcement, Barry not only denied any knowledge of Suzanne's affair, but also called his marriage perfect right up until the night of Saturday, May 11th. He even said that they'd had sex that night. It was so perfect that he spent Mother's Day, the day that she apparently disappeared, he spent that day 150 miles away from her. And she was basically would have been alone that day. Barry has also said he would understand why investigators could imagine an affair and a divorce could play into motive. Again, according to lawandcrime.com, quote, and this is quoting from the affidavit, but quoting what Barry said, so I can see through an investigator's eyes that, that they would look at something like that and say, well, yeah, if they were going to get a divorce, then Barry, you know, might might do something. But that just was not the case. I mean, absolutely not the case. But what if it was the case? What I mean there is, what if he did have a motive? Now, having a motive doesn't necessarily mean that he committed the crime and certainly doesn't prove that he committed the crime. But this is now a murder investigation. Both sides acknowledge that. And you'd imagine the police would want to talk to Barry again. Having a motive and being responsible, as I say, aren't necessarily the same thing. But a key question here is, who did have the best motive? And also, why did Barry lie and try to hide the true state of his marriage? One area that's definitely somewhat mysterious is, was Barry having an affair? Well, his wife seemed to think so. Interestingly, in the Chris Watts case, he denied having an affair, but he did admit that on the day that Shanann died, that uh, they discussed a separation. So he acknowledged that things weren't going so well in their marriage. It should also be noted that Barry's lawyer has called police theories ludicrous. Well, the one about Suzanne running away to Ecuador and that she might decide to come home, you know, when she perhaps had a change of heart, that was clearly one of the most ludicrous theories in this case, and now it's been disproved. In its place was quite an interesting statement saying, Barry has never gone south of his residence to the area where the remains were found. This is a statement from Barry's lawyer. At no time did this FBI, the CBI, Shaffey County Sheriff's Office, or the DA's office pinpoint or even generally claim that Barry was in any area south, south of his home, near Moffat or anywhere near Sawachi County at any relevant time frame. And of course, if you look in the at the defense exhibits, it actually shows that Barry was in the area near, um, is it Creestone? She goes on to say, it would be ludicrous for anyone to now try to fit the now known facts to prior false assumptions and accusations. She noted that her client was the most scrutinized, dissected, surveilled individual. Okay, so, so I do want to refer to page 73 of the redacted affidavit the March 1, 2021 interview. 
In this interview, Barry, according to the affidavit, altered his prior statements to adjust to evidence presented to him. It's just quite interesting, the words in this document compared to what his lawyers just said to people, uh, you know, trying to, to apparently do the same thing. But the this particular page refers to the route that Barry took and that, it, that he didn't go straight to Broomfield, that there's missing mileage from his return to, to the trip home from the Broomfield Hotel and that there's apparently 14 extra miles. That wouldn't get you to Moffat, certainly uh, wouldn't get you there and back, but there certainly is a 14 extra miles that don't seem to make complete sense in terms of that journey. So one thing that is quite curious is that when Barry left for Broomfield, he was asked, did you turn left or right onto Highway 50? And of course, turning right takes you to Denver, turning left takes you in the opposite direction. And so this is what he said. According to the affidavit, he said, yeah, there was a herd of elk in the road and there's one bull and there was a nice bull and then he followed this bull and then he said he went down to Garfield and, and turned around and went to Broomfield. Now, we really do want to look closer at those telematics and at that statement. But it, and it may be true that Moffat wasn't part of the original police narrative, but the defense can also acknowledge that they've made some several major course corrections on their own stories. The biggest one, the blust about Suzanne being alive. From the state of her remains, Suzanne has been deceased for years. So I'm not going to take it further than that. In the next analysis, we'll examine the legal merits facing both sides in more detail. I hope you're having a good weekend. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.